to discuss reimagining the food system. I'm joined by Sophie Akoff, the co-executive director, National Young Farmers Coalition. Hello, I'm Jean Meserve, a contributor to Atlantic Live, and we want to welcome you to our annual Atlantic Festival. It is great to have you with us. For the next hour, we are going to be talking about our food system and specifically how it relates to climate change and also to hunger. We're going to talk about solutions and what these bold initiatives might take in terms of government policy change, collaboration, or community action. We have gathered some top experts to discuss these topics over the next hour. But before we get started, a couple of words. First of all, I would like to thank our underwriter, the Walton Family Foundation, for their support of the Atlantic Festival and the Atlantic's journalism. I also want to ask all of you at home to participate. You can do that using the Q&A tab. And please, if you do submit a question, give us your name, tell us where you are, and I will get to as many of those questions as I possibly can. So now let's dig in. Ashley, I would like to start with you. Food production accounts for about one quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, millions around the world are going hungry. What does it say about our food system? Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks so much for uh, inviting me to, to join this just amazing platform. Um, I'm, I, I'm just thrilled that people are coming in from, from all over the world and on all sorts of different uh, topics. I've been focusing on Climate Week this week, so I'm, I'm here in New York, New York uh, participating in Climate Week. And so what's top of my mind is climate change. And so when you mentioned that, that food is driving one quarter of, of global emissions, that's absolutely correct. You know, food matters. That's really the, the takeaway uh, message here. Um, but also, we could do something about food. Food could also be a solution uh, to climate change. And so that's really what, what we have to uh, band together and, and, and do and sort of work through those solutions. That's where Oatly comes in. I, I work for Oatly, uh, the uh, company that produces uh, oat milk and oat-based products. And, you know, we really see this as an opportunity to provide solutions that people can access on, on a daily basis through their food, through what they eat. And, and, and that's actually, really what we issue here. And actually, I promise you we're going to get there. But before we get to solutions, I want to talk a little bit more about the problem and how they interlock. Um, Hubert, you collect data on U.S. agriculture. What are the numbers telling you? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be a part of the panel today. Uh, we collect a lot of different numbers on within uh, agriculture. Uh, we look at the uh, production of uh, all of the major commodities across the United States. But what we're seeing in major trends right now, uh, major shifts in technology use, uh, inclu including computers and mobile devices by farm producers and have, has greatly in, in, increased on farm operations. Uh, we're seeing changes in the number of farms and land and farms. They have declined over the past few decades. We're seeing the average size of a farm has actually increased. And then looking at some of the demographic characteristics, the average age of producers has gone from 53 years of age in uh, 2002 to 57 years of age in uh, 2017. So we're seeing some changes uh, in the structure. Uh, we're also seeing some changes in the data that we collect at NAS. Uh, we're collecting more demographic data now. Uh, for instance, on our census of agriculture, we collect information on up to four producers that captures the uh, role of women, veterans, and minorities in farm operations. So we're trying to concentrate on much more than just production. Uh, so we need information on the people who provide the food, feed, and fiber for our world, as it is the foundation and key ingredients for agricultural research business, policy, education, and farming. Hubert, are you collecting any data that indicates what impact climate change is having on farming? Well, 
it, it does have an impact, obviously, uh, on uh, on agriculture, and uh, it affects uh, food availability and access, utilization, and stability of these items. And if you have constrictions at any point in those food chains, uh, obviously, you're going to see some impact. Um, so Sophie, you represent young farmers. Can you talk first about the challenges that they're facing right now? Are they economic? Are they environmental? And specifically, is climate change having an impact on their operations? Yeah, absolutely. Young farmers are passionate about building a different, brighter future for agriculture, you know, feeding their communities good food and stewarding uh, the land that they access. Um, but they are not operating an agriculture system that was designed for their success. So this context is important. Um, centuries of racist farm policy has dictated who can farm in this country. And that policy has been used to dispossess indigenous people of millions of acres of land and to perpetuate discrimination against black, indigenous, and other people of color, resulting in 98% of farmland owned by white people. So these, these farm policies um, have been meant to exclude and really shift power and resources to the very few, incentivizing industrialization and consolidation of farms, uh, leading to the disappearance of millions of family farms. And so um, that environment for the next generation, it's not conducive to their success, right? So these are structural challenges and we need structural solutions. Land access is the number one, no matter where they're farming, if they're from a farm family or not. That's even harder for young farmers of color. And this is a real issue because we're on this precipice of huge land transition in this country. Um, and young farmers and farmers of color are not in the position to compete for this land with non-farmers and more established, more capitalized farms. And then climate, uh, as you mentioned, yep. That's what I wanted you to get to. In addition to the land yeah. access question, talk to me about how the changing uh, climate is is changing things for farmers. Yeah, so climate is having an everyday real impact on our farmers' operations. It's the top policy priority for farmers. They need climate action now. And their access to land is actually really deeply intertwined with their climate resiliency. So without land security, farmers can't invest in regenerative practices that are going to really let them build soil health and be able to withstand climate pressures, climate catastrophes. Um, but if they do have access to land, you know, young farmers are more likely than the national average to be using climate smart practices and are really in a position to mitigate climate change and build resiliency on their farms. Um, Ashley, um, increasing production often means using more land, which can compound the climate problem when you're talking about, in other countries in particular, things like deforestation. So is it possible to address both of these things simultaneously, increasing production, reducing the climate footprint? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the... Uh, major, major pressures on, on land use is, is livestock. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that livestock really uses the majority of uh, agriculture land. And so as we can look for new ways for people to access plant-based products, um, that can also free up some of those resources that right now are dedicated um, to the animal-based uh, sector. So that's just one way that, that we can sort of find both climate solutions and look at other environmental issues like land use, like deforestation, and find solutions that really um, help to uh, contribute to um, solving both. Um, Sophie, uh, let me come back to you and ask you about farming practices. Um, did they need to change? And what are the principal obstacles to making that change? Yeah, so, and you know, Young farmers are a great example of uh, employing climate smart strategies. And this is not only out of a sense of environmental urgency, which is real, um, but because they make the most sense for their operations economically. Um, 
However, these practices are really expensive to implement and you only see the benefits, they're long-term practices, right? So you see the benefits over um, multi-year spans. And so a way to bolster um, farmer adoption of climate smart practices and support young people who are already doing them and farmers of color who are already doing them uh, is the government support and government support for ecosystem uh, services. Things like perennial crops, conservation tillage, fire management, rotational grazing, cover cropping. And I wanna say these are practices rooted in indigenous practice that have conserved land and water resources for centuries. Um, so really acknowledging the root um, and making sure that those farmers who are already uh, employing those practices are compensated in addition to the farmers who need to be converting their practices towards these more regenerative practices. Great. Ashley, I want to come back to private industry. Um, you started to tell us a bit more about Oatly. Flesh it out a little bit. Tell us what the company is. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, at its heart, Oatly is a sustainability company uh, that happens to sell oat milk. That's what you'll hear our CEO uh, say. And, and really what that means is that um, we really view our business and, and, what, and the products we provide people as a way to help uh, solve uh, major international problems such as, as climate change. So that's sort of really core to our values and beliefs and is really part and parcel with our products, which are you know, oat-based alternatives to dairy. Now, uh, how that sort of plays out and how we operate our, our business is that we're really trying to make massive change in two ways. One, really shift the food system and address you know, what's broken, what we've been talking about already as part of this uh, conversation. And we wanna do that, responding to what Sophie was saying, in partnership with farmers who are really on the front lines of climate change, uh, but also are the change makers and who are really the experts in knowing what are these practices that can help shift that food system. So companies really have a responsibility to work with farmers and support them in that effort. Then on the other side, you know, we want to work with and empower consumers and customers so that they are part of what we call the plant-based revolution and that they see through their food choices they can actually have a difference on what often seems like you know, existential, really challenging uh, issues that are, are, are sort of difficult to, to grasp. We really think food is, is the gateway um, to really helping empower people to, to make a change. Uh, so Ashley, one big question I hear all the time is whether a sustainable company can be a profitable company, can it? That is what we are setting out to prove, yes. Um, you know, we really think that- <laughs> yeah, I think so far we're, we're, we're proving it successfully. You know, we want to show that sustainability value is something that is investment value, that that really uh, a company that prioritizes sustainability is one that's setting themselves up for success in the future, not only responding to what a growing number of consumers are asking for, but also putting in place those uh, kinds of practices that are going to make a business more resilient in light of these global challenges. So a company that, you know, really prioritizes sustainability, prioritizes climate action is also going to be a company that can face the massive changes that are coming uh, with more success. So, yes, we think that uh, we think that we're showing that today and we want to keep showing that into the future. So, Ashley, do you think that private industry really has to drive the change to sustainability? 100 percent. Private industry really does have to drive this action. You know, government action is key. And I think we've seen governments uh, step up with their commitments, you know, join in, in sort of the global effort uh, like coming together for the Paris Agreement. But in many cases, governments move slow and industry can really step in and bring those commitments to life and show that change is possible on the ground with everyday uh, people in a much quicker way um, than governments can. Uh, but let's talk about the government role and what it can do, what it needs to do, what it will do. Uh, Hubert, you're our government representative here. So your thoughts, please. What's government's role? Thank you. Uh, we're following the science. 
uh, new strategies and management practices must be developed to allow ag systems to mitigate and adapt at, uh, to the impacts of climate change. Uh, USDA is leveraging technology to advance climate smart land use conservation and precision agriculture for food and current future uh, generations. We have climate hubs that are in place to provide real-time data for data users and researchers to be able to uh, provide that information of, of what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, this is a great opportunity to use the department's expertise in conservation, science, and research, and also the passion and commitment of our farmers, ranchers, and private uh, forest owners. Uh, to put the United States in a leadership position on climate smart agriculture. So I think you have to have private uh, and uh, government uh, working together uh, to solve some of these complex issues. Uh, USDA is working on a producer survey right now to better understand the adaptation of conservation programs. Having that data available and easily accessible is critical to ensuring that producers, policymakers, uh, and USDA leaders make the most informed decisions on feeding a growing population. Uh, so being good stewards of resources, uh, all of that helps uh, as we move forward again. I, I believe collectively uh, that's the best way to move forward. Sophie, you're the one with literally boots on the ground. Are you hearing what you want to hear and need to hear from Hubert? Yeah, you know, we work closely with USDA and Congress to. Uh, address the climate crisis and are currently working in coalition to advocate for 30 billion in climate smart conservation in Congress's reconciliation package. Uh, we need that funding and we need that funding to be accessible to young farmers of color, small scale farmers, in addition to larger scale farmers converting. Um, and we also need to look at land and we need a historic investment in land in the next farm bill so that land can transition equitably to the next generation so farmers can really be mobilized to do this work that we need to be done. Hubert, do you want to respond to that land issue, the point that Sophie makes? Well, land is the most precious resource in agriculture. The last census of agriculture indicated there were roughly about 900 million acres of land in the United States. The average size farm is increasing up to about 431 acres uh, per farm. Uh, so that's the key, uh, high dollar uh, investments to get into, to, get, to buy land, to buy very expensive uh, equipment needed to uh, farm that land. So obviously uh, that is a very, very uh, central part of the argument. Uh, we do have an audience question. Let me get to that. What is being done to bring in younger farmers and to encourage small farming? Sophie, you want to start with that one? Yeah, you know, and I think the most important thing for young people to get into agriculture is to see others succeed in it, right? So I think our focus as a coalition is really not quite in speaking to high school students about choosing a career in agriculture. It's about ensuring that the young people right now who are getting into agriculture are able to stay in agriculture stay in agriculture and find economic and ecological success in it and i think that is going to be the biggest proof point for others to hop on board uh hubert do you want to weigh into what's being done to encourage younger farmers and smaller farms uh, there are programs uh, within the department that encourages uh, young producers to get involved i know some of the other uh, partners that we work with outside of USDA, uh, uh, the Farm Bureau and, and other organizations have young farmer programs. There are tools in place at USDA to help support these individuals, to provide their research, the educational needs that they need to get involved. Uh, so there are some tools uh, out there uh, to help young producers get involved. Uh, we have a oh, circular oh, oh, oh. and it seems to me escalating problem. We need to produce more food, but that impacts the climate, which further destabilizes the food supply. I'd like all of you to weigh in on how we change the system. And uh, Ashley, why don't I start with you there? Yeah, I, you know, the fact of the matter is that 
uh, right now, animal-based products are using up a significant proportion of the resources and yet providing just 20% of, of calories globally. And so we have that opportunity through making a shift toward plant-based. And, you know, I mean on that journey. I'm not talking about a black and white, all one way or all the other, but really making that shift toward plant-based that can both provide more food, provide more sustainable food, but also use less of those resources. And I think that's a really critical part of the solution. Uh, in addition, Hubert, do we need uh, new technologies, let's say new fertilizers that are less damaging to climate? Well, I I'll say this. Uh Scientific research is and how always has been the key uh, to the American agricultural success. So through integrated research, uh, data analysis and education, USDA's agricultural research and education programs work to create safe, sustainable and competitive U.S. agriculture. And, and uh, I, I believe that's the way to go. We have to invest in, and uh, again, all the new technology and research, whether it's fertilizer, uh, other inputs uh, to make sure that uh, the input costs are uh, uh, such that producers can be uh, competitive. Uh, the key is the bottom line for these producers. If they're not successful economically, uh, they're not able to continue uh, uh, in, in farming. Uh, Sophie, any further thought from you on this mega problem, this larger problem of how we produce more food but impact the climate less? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's all about shifting where we're putting our government resources, right? So the majority of Farm Bill dollars go towards programs like crop insurance, commodity programs, and conservation programs that are largely inaccessible for the most diversified small-scale regenerative operations. Uh, the program, the Beginning Farmer Training Program that was mentioned that's so important, uh, along with outreach for socially disadvantaged farmers, is... $50 million a year combined, but the farm bill is $420 billion, right? So we're talking about so much um, taxpayer dollars that can really be unlocked to solve climate change by really investing in climate smart agriculture and young people. Um, Ashley, Ashley, if I might, let me ask you, um, how much time do we have? How quickly do we have to change things up and do things differently? incredibly quickly. I mean, as you sort of referenced in the beginning there, this is the climate decade. We have less than a decade to really take major action on climate change, according to all the latest science from the IPCC. And so that's why I think making these kinds of changes that all three of us have been talking about are so critical. And we have the ability to do it. We have the technology to do it. So we need to get started today. Ashley Allen, Sophie Acoff, and Hubert Hamer, thank you all for joining us today. We have to leave it there. Thank you. And now for a session brought to you by our underwriter, Walton Family Foundation, Seafood, Sustainable Protein During Climate Change. Please welcome Hannah Heimbach, Senior Consultant of Ocean Strategies Incorporated, and Moira McDonald, Environment Program Director at Walton Family Foundation. Hi, my name is Moira McDonald, and I'm the Director of the Environment Program at the Walton Family Foundation. As we're here today talking about food and what we eat this hour, we want to talk about sustainable seafood, which is quite simply the fish, shellfish, and seaweed that is managed and harvested with responsible methods and supported by science. I'm here to talk today with one of our grantees, Hannah Heimbach, who is both a fisherman and an expert in fisheries policy. Hannah, so much is happening in the world right now from climate disaster to COVID. So I wanna start out with something that's uplifting and ask you, what's giving you hope right now? That is a great question for right now. Um, and I would say that it's the resiliency of the seafood world that's giving me hope. Uh, and I'll give you two examples of that. First, as you know, bringing seafood to the table depends upon a lot of people often working in really difficult, isolated locations. And during the pandemic in the North Pacific, I have watched people just move mountains to keep America's seafood supply working and making sure essential fishery science happens. And, and these are individual fishermen and scientists and governments, big and small businesses that understand 
This is a precious ecosystem. This is a cornerstone economy and it's an essential food source for a globe in crisis. So what has given me hope honestly is seeing people pull together to keep food moving uh, from ocean to plate. I think that's been super inspiring. And uh, my second example looks from the harvesting world then to the consumer. Americans right now are eating more seafood than they ever have before, more than 30% more actually. Also on the rise are consumers wanting to know where their seafood comes from. And so to me, this is so much more than consumer data. This is actually really cool stuff. It means a growth in our taste for healthy protein, which the FDA is recommending that we eat more of. And it's a protein with a lower carbon footprint than many other sources. So right now what I'm seeing, I'm seeing adaptations for the better. It gives me hope that we have the capacity for resilience and for new growth. I, I love that you have so much hope. Um, and I love hearing you talk about from ocean to plate. Um, people often forget about the ocean as a part of the food system. Okay, let's move on to the next question. What can people do to be good sea sustainable seafood consumers? What can we be looking for or listening for either in the grocery store or the restaurant to be creating more demand for sustainable seafood? You know, this can sound tough, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be an overnight expert, right, to make some thoughtful choices. And everything that I'm going to recommend is about communication. It's about having an open dialogue with the people who supply your food. And whether that means for you a monthly seafood subscription direct from a seafood business or you're buying from a grocery store, I can tell you, like, these people want your questions and your feedback. So what you can do to start is, is ask. You can ask at the counter or wherever you buy your seafood where does this come from? And then you can ask also if they follow any particular, you know, sustainability policies when they buy as a business. And, you know, the staff person you interact with might not be able to tell you everything about their suppliers, but they should know the country of origin. That gives you some info to follow up on. Um, for me, I like to buy U.S. seafood. I happen to be familiar with the standards in the U.S., but of course, there is a massive variety of great sustainable seafood options that come from all over the world. And knowing the country country of origin helps you to investigate, you know, what the standards are at that source. When it comes to sustainability policies, it sounds more complicated, but that's where that communication comes from. And, and asking some questions at the counter is just one way. There's a lot of other resources out there, though. Um, the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions is an international community of organizations. I'd highly encourage people to, to look at them, look at their resources and partners. Um, and, and beyond that, just know where your grocer or your favorite restaurant stands. Let them know what you expect for, from sourcing. You know, some examples on the East Coast, I know that Publix and Hy-Vee, they're very knowledgeable about where their seafood comes from. They have strong sustainable sourcing policies. Uh, other parts of the country, thinking the Midwest um, and the West Coast, there's Giant Eagle, Albertsons, New Seasons. You know, there's grocers all over the country that are really paying attention to sustainable sourcing. And it doesn't take much to reach out to a manager or a rep and, and just ask how they approach it. And, and again, you know, they are paying attention to what you have to say. So are their national representatives uh, like FMI, the Food Industry Association. These folks are working to respond to you. Thank you. I heard you mention policy. So I want to pick up on that to ask you as an advocate for fishers, what do you see on the policy front right now? And then what should we be watching on the horizon? Sure. So much, of course, it's the ocean, right? Um, but I'll tell you about three specific things that I'm tracking. Uh, first, we have the Mag Magnuson-Stevens Act. This is America's overarching federal fisheries law. It gets reauthorized every 10 years. Uh, Congressman Jared Huffman from California has been working with Congress on new legislation introduced this summer to reauthorize that law. And this includes some really important updates on a big range of things like habitat conservation, climate resiliency, reducing bycatch. It's a lengthy process, but super important. And it impacts a huge amount of the seafood supply chain. Number two, we have aquaculture and mariculture policies. This is the arena where we talk about shellfish, seaweed, and fish farming. Uh, and as a wild harvest fisherman, I'm watching this really closely because I want to be sure any policies and practices developed are responsible and environmentally sound, and then can work safely alongside our wild fisheries. Uh, third, uh, we have the Biden administration's America the Beautiful Initiative, sometimes called 30 by 30. It's an effort to conserve 30% of US land and waters by the year 2030. And uh, fishing communities are working really closely with the administration to be sure that 
part of that conservation vision includes healthy fishing communities and food security, uh, seafood security. Um, and finally, I'll just say when it comes to policy, uh, let your representatives in Congress know that sustainable food is important to you. You don't have to be from the coastal state to do this. Uh, we eat seafood in all 50 states. Excellent. And just in closing, um, tell me why seafood is important, uh, sustainable seafood is important to you as a fisher person. Absolutely. Um, you know, this part's really simple. Every time I pack up my gear and pull my boots and head out onto the water, I fall in love with the ocean again and with the marine landscape. And that's something that I'm really passionate about uh, sharing with people. I think, you know, I, I'm just a small boat wild salmon fisherman from Alaska. That's one little corner of the world. But I love being a bridge between wild creatures and the rest of the planet. I think that connection is crucial to, the, to our future and that people who depend on the ocean for food are connected to the value of those benefits and will be long-term stewards for it. So it's, it's an honor to be part of uh, the fisheries ecosystem and to talk about sustainable seafood. Great, thank you. Thank you. For our final discussion, we'll discuss what consumers can do with Yvette Cabrera, director of the Food Waste, Healthy People and Thriving Co If you heard all those introductions, so I'll repeat them. We have with us Yvette Cabrera, Nate Mook, Executive Director of World Central Kitchen, and Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Heber Brown, pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church and founder of the Black Church Food Security Network. Um, Nate, through your work with World Central Kitchen, you are really seeing this intersection between food insecurity and climate change with working in disasters, where you see climate change accelerating more and more climate events, what is the impact on food systems? Um, you know, how people are uh, making a living, uh, how they're feeding their families are uh, is changing right in front of us. Um, we're seeing larger impacts from climate-related disasters like hurricanes that are devastating farmlands. And, you know, all of this is sort of coming together to create a situation where it's very difficult now in many places for families to survive the way that they had, you know, not too long ago. That's leading to an increase in uh, migration. Families are moving to try to uh, find ways to simply uh, feed their children. Uh, and it's also, of course, making uh, countries themselves a lot less uh, stable as the food system starts to break down, uh, you know, reliant on more and more imports. The cost of those of that food is is much more expensive than if it were grown locally. Uh, and it really is sort of this very complex challenge that we're seeing right in front of us. Uh, I'm currently down in Del Rio, Texas, uh, under the bridge where, where many, uh, mostly Haitian uh, migrants and refugees have gathered. Uh, numbers were about 16,000 uh, as of uh, earlier this weekend. They have come down now. But talking to many of these Haitians, they talk about you know an inability to, to farm as they used to inability to grow food, to feed their families, um, inability to, uh, you know, to work. And that's leading to this, this mass shift that, that is impacting the world. And of course, the greatest impacts are felt in the poorest places, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, it's these, these communities that are reliant on the land and that are just trying to get through every day you know, those are the ones that are seeing the, the first impacts of this. But of course, I think we're going to start seeing this across the board. And this type of access to food isn't just in places that we sort of assume it is, you know, internationally and in places like Haiti or in places like Central America. I mean, this is happening in our communities, right in our backyards in cities like Baltimore and Detroit and Oakland, where access to food um, is, is access to fresh and healthy food is becoming very difficult. And and the type of work we, we need to invest in the work we do in those communities. Uh, Yvette, these problems of hunger and climate are immense. They can be paralyzing to people. Can individual action make a difference? I'm so sorry. I cannot hear the moderator, but I think that 
I heard or saw my name uh, said, so I will just hop in here. Um, I I believe that I um, lip read a question about the kind of connection between climate change and hunger. Uh, is that correct? Maybe you can give me a head nod. Um, Yvette, I I'm not you hearing hear you. I'm not sure if anyone else can hear us, but I could not hear you there. I can... We'll come back to you in just a moment. Hopefully we'll straighten that out. But okay. Reverend Brown, I'm going um, to go we on have seen food lines here. during this pandemic. Uh, kids out of school weren't getting the lunches they normally got. Now we're seeing food prices going up in the U.S. Is the hunger problem getting much worse? I don't know if it's getting uh, much worse as it is becoming more apparent. It's becoming more difficult to ignore, particularly for communities like mine and many others. These issues have long been here. Uh, and so the pandemic basically just ripped the covers off of the fallacy of everything is okay. And so I am. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunities that we have to organize amongst those who are most directly affected and impacted by food insecurity issues. And as much as we talk about food access, our organization, the Black Church Food Security Network, also likes to focus on another A word, agency. Agency. That when local communities who are most directly impacted by food insecurity and what we call food apartheid as well, uh, charity alone does not go far enough to get to some of the root challenges there. And so for me, I did hear the question about this, can individual action uh, make a change? I think it makes some difference, but the greatest and more sustainable difference is when those who are most directly impacted are organizing to create alternative systems to challenge the systems that currently have them and have us in the most oppressive and inhumane situations. Growing food at your church, and now you've expanded this to other churches. Tell us about this project. Yeah, the, the Black Church Food Security Network really stemmed out of my own church's experience. Uh, about more than 10 years ago, we started growing food in the front yard of our congregation. And I began to see that churches can be powerful actors and agents in co-creating micro food systems that bring people closer to the land, help people return to their roots in a literal sense. Uh, for many black folk, we came north and went west during the great migration over run out of the south from our land. And so when our churches are inviting people back to the land for gardening, it really helps to activate and reignite something that is deep within and gives us the sense that we really can um, impact some of our own material conditions with support from everybody. But again, I'll just say it's very important that those who are most directly impacted by these issues are leading the way and not invited to the table as afterthoughts to somebody else's plan. The Black church community, I'll say quickly, Collectively, Black churches own more land than any other institute, institution in Black America in the country. And so our big vision and dream is to have Black churches take their land, their kitchens, their vans, and their credibility in their local community to engineer the co-creation of these micro food systems in partnership with small farmers, with truck drivers, with environmentalists and activists. And I really do believe that this pandemic, as much as it has caused great pain, it's also provided an opportunity for us to see a different way forward. Yvette, I'm hoping that I can hear you now. So let me, let me ask you if this is exactly the kind of community solution we have to be moving towards. Absolutely. And I can hear you now, so thank you. Um, we at NRDC really focus our efforts um, starting with the community. One of our main projects is working with municipal governments to implement different food waste uh, policies and programs throughout the city. But we start from the ground up, really trying to understand what the local needs are, what the community uh, would like to see within their communities, and also what efforts are already ongoing that we can support and bring kind of 
you know, national resources to, uh, because there's already really wonderful work happening on the ground. There are many food waste efforts ongoing, and uh, part of NRDC's role is to really figure out how we can kind of lift those up and also share examples of that great work across the United States to hopefully replicate and scale them. So. I am so sorry, I cannot hear you again. Um, so we will try to figure that out. This Reverend Brown, let me come back to you. Can you hear me? I got you now. Okay, excellent. Um, so there's an interesting story behind what you're doing. There was a very specific event in Baltimore where you're based that generated your interest in that. Tell us about that. 2015, of Freddie Gray, the hands of Baltimore police officers. It was in the middle of that social upheaval, the uprising, as we call it here in Baltimore, where the Black Church Food Security Network was born. It was born in that context in part because many of the social services and charities and foundations at the height of the uprising, backed up off of the black community, at least the most economically part of the city. As you said earlier, the school system shut down for a couple of days, public transportation stopped in a few communities, and also a curfew was put on certain parts of the city. In essence, all of the social structures that many black folks in the city were depending on in the midst of that upheaval backed up off of the Black community. It was at that time that our historic institution of Black churches leaned back in to reclaim the role that we long had been in before foundations and charities and even governments were more sensitive and desirous to support our community. And so what I've seen is that in the midst of that kind of social upheaval, for our case, it was police brutality. In other situations, let's talk about Hurricane Katrina, black churches did the same thing. Same thing. And so on the issue of climate, it's also important for me for us to recognize the last time I spoke to talk about another A word of agency, I'll give you one more A word. Asset-based community development. What do communities already have in their hand that's not grant funded, that's not supported by government, but it is helping to support that local community? And for us, for Black folks in terms of land and the nation where gentrification and redlining and the theft of land from Black farmers is deep and long in the country, Black church-owned land is sacred, collectively stewarded, and we see it as a part of the solution for transforming our material conditions. Uh, Nate, can you hear me now? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. It looks like you can. Excellent. Okay. Um, I asked you before, and let me repeat this now that you can hear me. Um, if you find this to be globally true, that that the, the solutions are most effective when they're local, when they're either come from the ground up within the or, or adapted very carefully to meet the community needs. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, as uh, Reverend Brown said, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely critical that the communities themselves are the ones creating the solutions and involved in, in the implementation of the solutions around these issues. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, what we're seeing with the impact of food insecurity or lack of food in many communities across the United States, you know, these are communities that are you know, historically disadvantaged for all of the issues that Reverend Brown mentioned and more that puts them in a vulnerable state to start with. And then when you have something like a COVID pandemic or a natural disaster, like a hurricane hitting New Orleans, I just came back from New Orleans, you know, what you see is that those that are really impacted by these issues and, and have no access to resources um, are those that, that were already 
uh, impacted, right? These are these are areas that don't have access to fresh and healthy food, or two miles away is the is the closest grocery store. You know, the communities that don't have the income to you know somehow you know have a lot of cars to go drive somewhere, and and they're often left behind. And so the only way that you can really you know start to change that is by empowering those communities to you know to have ownership to develop the solutions themselves to empower the local businesses to empower the local leaders and you know you're seeing the beginnings of that you're seeing um you know real progress being made by amazing organizations like uh what Reverend Brown is doing uh we down in New Orleans you know the folks that were leading the way in supporting areas like the lower ninth ward after the hurricane were the churches, were the black churches. Um, you know, so we were coming in as, you know, with our with our resources, what we have to bring to the table, but we were listening to them and letting them tell us what their needs were and how we could support them best. What what are the ways that we can help serve help you serve your community, not how can we come in with and, and do the work. And so I think it's that shift of mindset is very important. And and that holds true across the board. You know, we look at uh, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. You know, Puerto Rico was importing 85% of its food or more before the hurricane hit. And so you wonder how can a community that is so reliant on outside support be self-sustainable or resilient? We hear this term resilient a lot. And how does that actually happen? And the only way to do it is the opportunities for those living in these communities to 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 progress right the the far the small farmers to have access to markets um you know to to have the same access to resources and you know and funding and other things that that many other more privileged uh communities have so i think it's a starting point still a lot of work to do but but i think we are you know some of the things that that are working Can't can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, Yvette cannot hear me. Can okay, I hear now you're you? Back. Now you're back. Oh, now I'm back. Okay, Yvette. Um, I was saying that you're addressing the food waste part of the equation. How much food is being thrown away? About forty percent of the food is thrown away, and that is not only a huge environmental tragedy and also problem uh, for climate change. But it also means that a lot of really healthy, good, and nutritious food that could be making it to people. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, music is done. A lot of a little musical food. interlude here. <laughs> uh, a lot of healthy and really nutritious food that could be making it to people's plates rather than a landfill is not making it there. And hunger during COVID has skyrocketed. It's become more visible, but it's not a new problem. Uh, it's a longstanding problem that has deep issues rooted in things like disparities in pay, in housing. And these are really issues that need to be addressed at multiple levels. Um, we need you know, support from the federal government, but we as is being said on this panel, to really embrace community solutions and, and build those solutions from the ground up. Um, and I want to talk in, to you about solutions in just a second, but first I want you to clarify something. You said that food waste was making the climate situation worse. Explain why that is. Absolutely. When we grow food, we have to invest a massive amount of resources to grow that food. So that's everything from the seeds to the water that it takes to actually grow those seeds uh, into food, it's the land that's needed to grow that food. Uh, for many different forms of agriculture, it's all of the inputs that go into the production of that food, like fertilizer. It also means that we are, you know, packing up that food, sometimes putting it in things like plastic and transporting it from the farm to grocery stores, all of the even from you know very far away countries to your local grocery store, all of that means that we are investing resources in food that we may or may not eat, and that it's not just the problem of the food that is grown; it's also the food that 
when it ends up in a landfill, it creates massive amounts of methane emissions. And so methane, uh, methane is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases. And so when you're not only wasting all of the resources that went into growing that food, you're generating additional emissions by putting that food in the landfill. And we actually see the food system and, and food waste in particular as a particular way to uh, change what could be a very, you know, is a very um, not climate friendly process and system into something that's actually highly beneficial, not, not just for the planet, but also for people. Reverend Brown, I'm curious if you think people waste less food if they're growing their own food. Well, my children will tell you that they take more pride in what they grow themselves. In fact, I can get them to try more food if they have their own hands in growing it. So I think that does play a part. But you know what? This conversation also makes me think about the ways in which we're working with faith communities to establish composting systems at their churches. Uh, last year, uh, the Black Church Food Security Network established, uh, in partnership with the Institute for Self-Reliance, a three-bin compost system at Northside Baptist Church in Baltimore. This Saturday, we're doing it again at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in the city. I really do think that if we can bring a systems approach to our most organic institutions, I'm, I'm talking about churches, of course, but I know there's synagogues, mosques, there are uh, Red Hatters, civic organizations. If we can come with a civic, uh, I'm sorry, a systems approach to looking at the ways in which we already operations and then thinking and being more creative and courageous about how they operate, I think it really can make a difference even beyond growing food, but even on the issue of food waste, on food distribution, on consumption, you can go right on down the line. And so I'm, I'm having a ball reimagining what faith-based organizations can be and updating and upgrading people's thoughts about what they think past is fine. Uh, Nate, I'm wondering about World Central Kitchen and how it deals with the waste issue. Yeah, you know, it is something that we think about very carefully across the board. Um, you know, I, we operate oftentimes in very challenging environments. And for us, one of the easiest ways to kind of play a uh, a positive or at least a non-negative role in in the food waste issue is by purchasing everything we can locally. Um, so our teams have been working in Haiti, for example, since the earthquake, the recent earthquake hit the point in August. Um, it's been uh, well over a month now, and we have been able to purchase from local Haitian farmers uh, a lot of the produce, if not all of the produce that we're cooking with. Um, uh, and so that, you know, we can, a, you, you don't have to have, you know, the transport issues. You put the money back in the local economy and you can make sure that, especially in, in times of crisis, that, that you know, food that potentially would other go to, otherwise go to waste can be, you know, you know utilized um, in this case to, to make sure that families who are impacted by the earthquake, um, you know, have, have access to, to fresh and healthy food. So say it's a process you know we're not perfect and we try we try our best um you know you try to uh you know you try to make sure that that what you are purchasing and what you are utilizing and also able to identify local organizations that um that you know are able to have you know excess uh excess food that we can incorporate that ours can incorporate into the stream of of what we're cooking so you know, we think about it a lot um, and we're constantly sort of evolving and improving, um, you know, as we are, as we mobilize to respond to crises in sometimes faraway places that can be a challenge. But but I'll tell you, the most important thing that we do is the very first thing we do when we get on the ground is connect with local farmers, local producers, and local leaders. So we're not having to, you know, sort of in this, you know, mass sort of, um, you know, both transportation issues and, and huge amount of of environmental impact of the food that that we're purchasing. So, um, you know, in 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 Haiti, for example, we were cooking with with carrots and beans that are literally pulled down the same day that we were cooking them. So, and we were using all of it. So it was it was a really great great way to to address it in in our way. But it is something that we think about a lot, and you know, an issue that that I think you know overall 
more people are thinking about, which is which is important because it is going to take a number. There's no there's no silver bullet. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, but I think going back to to what uh, Reverend Brown mentioned as well is I think, you know, we also need to be more cognizant of of where our food is coming from. And, you know, there are, uh, you know, incredible small farms out there that, you know, are doing, you know, producing amazing food. But if we're still we sort of, you know, systemically, we're still purchasing from huge multinational companies and and, you know, it's it sort of perpetuates the issue. And so I think being more thoughtful about, you know, where are the, the small farms? There's, there's great organizations out there. One, for example, we've been talking to called 40 Acres that identify, for example, you know, black farmers, um, you know, minority farmers that are producing uh, amazing food, maybe not at the scale that, you know, these big, these big organizations are, but still, you know, collectively, it's a great way to, um, you know, to, to reinvest in our food systems. We have an audience question here, and I'm not sure whose expertise this plays to, so it's going to be a jump ball. So, Rabbit, uh, someone asks, are there moves to make fish farming more sustainable? Do any of you know the answer to that question? Nobody's chiming in there. Yeah, um, I don't have a specific answer. Oh, there we go. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, I... I would say there absolutely are. I am not an expert. I the um, former or the grantee that just spoke right before us, I'm sure has some really wonderful uh, answers and examples to that question. Um, World Central Kitchen, Nate, has started something called the Climate Disaster Fund. What exactly is that? Yeah, so you know we're recognizing, as probably all of us are of these growing number of, of major disasters that are impacting our planet, both in the United States and elsewhere. And so, you know, the idea is that we can't sort of wait to respond, right? We, we have to be on the ground and immediately be prepared in advance. And the idea here, you know, is sort of thinking about it from the same way we might invest in a business, a local business, or, you know, infrastructure, it's how do we invest upfront in a number of different streams to make sure that we are ready for the changes that are impacting our planet, right? It's not, it's, it's already happening. We can do our best to mitigate long-term impacts, but the current impacts are going to be there. And so we have to acknowledge that. And then we have to think about the ways that we, you know, that we can start to address that. So some of that may be the response side of things, but a lot of it is in the preparation. So how do we make sure communities are able to withstand, you know, uh, a big disaster? It could be flooding, it could be a hurricane, wildfires. Um, how do we invest in those communities up front? And, and that's, of course, a lot of the work that uh, Reverend Brown is doing. How do we make sure that we're not wasting a lot of food so that can be utilized, um, you know, and we can be more efficient with our food systems. So that's the general, the general idea. Oh, can't hear me. Oh, let's wait just a now second. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. This is this is you know the the internet is having its its way with me today, <laughs> Reverend Brown. I was going to throw this question to you first, um, which is the news you could use part of this broadcast, which is what are the things that individuals and entities can do to make a difference on these intertwined issues of climate change and also hunger? Top recommendations. Wait, what are the things that individuals can do? Or communities, either one. Or communities. Okay, one, um, I, I'm, I love what you said there. Audre Lord said, this thing is a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And so one of the things that I would encourage communities to do is to recognize the ways in which these issues that we're talking about right now intersect with other issues that you care very deeply about especially in a time when all of us are living in the midst of a pandemic, 
we can experience compassion fatigue. We can just be like at our wits end, just trying to survive day to day. So one thing that has helped me a lot and those who I'm in community with is by see, is, is to look at the ways in which we're, we're currently putting energy, how it already intersects with other issues of import to our community as well. So I'll say start there. I would say get into an uh, activity and a mindset of doing some asset-based analysis of your community. Please resist the temptation to think that you need saviors to fly in to save you from all that is going on in your neighborhood. I actually think that does far more harm than good. I believe that the grandmothers, the children, the families, the mamas, the fathers in that neighborhood, the, the, the postal worker, the pastor, the street sweeper, in that community, you have the people who can bring a piece of the solution to the table. And when you all put your pieces together, something amazing can happen. I'll finish with the favorite Bible scriptures that says, despise not the days of small beginnings. We have gargantuan challenges. But somebody asked the question, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Please don't overwhelm yourselves to think you got to do everything overnight. Map out a plan, Yvette, take some steps and grow from there. Yvette, uh, let's try the small bite. Um, your top recommendations for individuals and communities to make an impact on these issues. Look locally, uh, as the Reverend is saying, there's so much happening on the ground. Stop by a community garden, stop by somewhere that might be working on anything related to the food system. Ask questions, ask how you can get involved. And also look inward. Um, I think everyone likes to think that they do, uh, they don't waste food and that they're really good at some of these things, but we all waste food. We all have a role to play within the food system. And it's important in the, in the community to also understand your own impact and use that to better kind of control your role in the community. Uh, Nate, very quickly, your top recommendations for what people and communities can do. Yeah, I'd say push your leaders in your city, in your community to reinvest uh, locally. You know, look, as as uh, Dr. Brown said, you know, don't don't bring in folks from the outside, you know, activate the resources that are there. Keep the dollars in the community, push the school systems to purchase from local farms and 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 scratch cook, you know, push your, you know, your your, you know, uh, programs to buy from local restaurants, not from big mega contractors, you know, just try to keep those dollars reinvested in your community, support small businesses and, you know, and build that ownership up over time. And we're going to have to leave it there. Nate Mook, Yvette Cabrera and Reverend Brown, thank you all for joining us today and for and for co our challenges, which we have made our way through and given people good information. Thank you all for being here. And we want to thank all of you who are watching for tuning in to the Atlantic Festival uh, this year. We hope you will stay with us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. We hope you will join us for a podcast taping with happiness expert Arthur Brooks and psychotherapist Lori Gottlieb. The full agenda is in the event. I'm going to be sending you email updates. I'm Jean Mazur. Thanks a lot for joining us and stay safe. While we're on a break, we encourage you to network with other attendees and visit our expo booths. To participate, select the networking icon located on the left-hand side of the screen. Next, click join and you'll be randomly paired with another attendee for about five minutes. If you wish, you can exchange virtual information with each other and keep in contact via direct message within the platform. You can also click the Explore icon to visit our virtual expo booths. Here you can explore more resources from the Atlantic and our underwriters related to today's event. We'll see you shortly after the break.